Hey, Satanico here for God Loves Comics. And this is a new series called Original Artifacts, where I pull up some original art online from some of the greatest artists in the medium and discuss it. This first segment was going to be a quartet of Alan Moore's artistic collaborators, but I had more to say than I anticipated, so I'm just going to do only two in this part and two in the next part. These are all artists who work with Alan Moore, although the work I show is not necessarily from works they collaborated on. First up is the great Brian Boland of Killing Joke fame. This is the cover for Judge Dredd number four from the year 1984, which couldn't be more appropriate given the fascistic nature of Judge Dredd. And what an amazing piece of draftsmanship, composition, and imagination. This is one of those pages you can just keep coming back to and finding new elements or delighting again and things that you noticed before. Every nook and cranny is filled with the tendrils of this flesh-eating plant. And look at how uh, Bolin integrates these thorny vines into the logo. One of the greatest logos ever. We see a human leg protruding from the mouth of this fly trap, more leaves and spiky, fleshy vines that almost looks like a tongue. Then you see the classic image of the vines protruding from every orifice, except for the nostrils of the skull. You would think that every metal band in England at the time would have seen this and wanted Boland to illustrate their album cover. But instead he was tapped to do an absolutely gruesome cover for a 1988 punk compilation album, Sounds and Shigaku, featuring bands such as Elvis Hitler. So feel free to look that one up because it is crazy. Um, you have the ever stoic and, as I said, fascistic Judge Dredd enforcing the law regardless of who and what is violating it. In this case, is this wildly out of control Venus flytrap monstrosity, and it's both simultaneously funny and gruesome. What immediately comes to mind is the Little Shop of Horrors, and I was wondering if uh, that was an influence, given that the Steve Martin, Rick Moranis version came out in the 80s. But I see the movie came out in 1986, and Boland's piece was done in 1984. However, Roger Corman's original version came out in 1960 with none other than Jack Nicholson in a small but memorable role as a nutty masochist who loved the pain of a dentist drill with no anesthesia. But Corman never had the budget to do what Bolin pulls off on this cover. At the bottom here you have absolute carnage. A body hanging upside down, a random leg there, a skeleton with this frond bursting from his shoulder socket, seemingly giving him a new vegetative limb. Uh, Bolin clears this negative space for Judge Dredd, so in all the chaos, the eye is drawn immediately to Dredd in this funny bit of dialogue, which given how it's faded in spots, almost looks like it was done in a Sharpie, but I assume it was a brush because it would have to be a really fat Sharpie tip. Just an amazing, almost flawless cover, and one of those covers that is so perfect in black and white that coloring it can only dull its majesty. So there you have it, an absolutely amazing cover from Brian Bolin. It's hard to believe it's almost now 40 years old, and yet here in the 21st century it still looks as fresh as a carnivorous daisy. And just as I say that Brian Boland's piece surely looked better in black and white than in color, along comes this color piece from Kevin O'Neill, best known for the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, at least in terms of his collaborations with Alan Moore, of course. If you haven't uh, seen it yet, check out my reading of Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill's adaptation of Orlando from L-O-E-G, The Black Dossier. This is another magnificent piece created by two stalwarts from the British market, O'Neill and writer Pat Mills. This one is in ink and watercolor on a very large section of Bristol board with an image area of 17 by 26, and that is quite large. The cover to Martial Law, Cloak of Evil from 2003. And again, there are so many details in this one cover that you can spend quite a while just sorting through it all. I would say it is a much more raw and has a less polished but more indie feel to it than Boland's piece. The elements are more transgressive, the composition much more cluttered, and that 
O'Neill doesn't offer the clean composition of Bolin. Nevertheless, with so much chaos on the page, it's all informational and substantial. Compare this to the typical overwrought image comics cover from around the same era and all those niggling little lines and scratches by Liefeld or Stephen Platt or whoever, and they're just bits of texture and ugly decor that serve no purpose. And surely if there were any words on those image covers, they were insipid. But here O'Neill overflows the page with information and words you actually want to read, like a much more coherent and technically adroit Jean-Michel Basquiat, if you will. At the top of the page, we see these two fascinating characters that alternately have an anime flair, but also hints of something akin to Nazi and Soviet era propaganda posters. The design patterns of the wings, and particularly in the Marshall's hat, work well. And yet, they also have sort of an amateurish feel of a kid in your high school who's pretty good at art and draws Kiss and Van Halen logos and ballpoint pin on all of his notebooks. The paper kind of notebooks. These days, it would be on a tablet with a stylus, thus losing all of his sex appeal but looking geometrically flawless. Although martial law was created from Marvel's epic comics line and takes place in America of some sort, you don't get any more British than the team of Pat Mills and Kevin O'Neill. So in this mask, I see the cross of St. George flag motif representing the English flag dating back to the Middle Ages, long before the Union Jack came to symbolize the United Kingdom with its inclusion of Scotland and Ireland, which makes for a very cool design with intrinsic, deeply nationalistic implications for British readers. So here, what appears to be an earring turns into something of a zipper for his jawline there. The really cool flying figure who has a bit of spawn influence is a super-powered serial killer named the Sleep Man, who may be due to a self-loathing or budgetary issues, wears a paper bag over his head. Graffiti in comics is always interesting and often gives a little insight into the artist or the author's political leanings, sense of humor and rebellious tendencies while also helping define the world they are illustrating. Here we see, we can't get no radiation, a play on the Rolling Stones, can't get no satisfaction. Sewer sides are up, which is a terrible play on words, befitting a graffitied wall. An even worse poke at Star Wars. And capes are us, suggesting the never ending commodification of superheroes, which is sort of what this whole series is really about anyway. There you see incorporated into Martial Law's outfit, it says Fear and Loathing, which is of course a Hunter S. Thompson reference, and the shoulder launching nuke as well as his pistol have American Star emblems on them, alluding to America's preoccupation with militarism and also its dominance of the international weapons trade, and our never-ending fascination with guns in general, which 40 years later hasn't changed a bit, in fact it's only gotten worse. There's so much going on here that it's easy to overlook this little bit here where it looks like a KKK hood is hanging from his belt, maybe the equivalent of a scalp that he took, hopefully so anyway. The martial law character is also drawn a bit stiff with a very conventional, again slightly amateurish pose, but it works perfectly as a sort of billboard for all of these emblems and accoutrements. His boot is also curb stomping a criminal who is not dissimilar from O'Neill's design of Mr. Hyde and L.O.E.G. If you ask me, I would have thought this cover came out before O'Neill's elegant stint on League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. But in fact, L.O.E.G. debuted four years earlier in 1999 near the nadir of Jim Lee's Image Wildstorm Studios. And... League was under the America's Best Comics line, which of course famously, when Wildstorm was absorbed by DC, Alan Moore's only explanation for why he would ever work with DC, which he had sworn off forever, was that he was behind the firewall of America's Best Comics line, which was a very, very fine distinction that not a lot of people bought into, but uh, perfectly fine at the same time because we wanted to see more work from Alan Moore and not to see him just throw up his hands and give up because DC had bought out Wildstorm Studios, which was obviously failing. 
Anyway, down here you see this BDSM figure at Martial Law's boots, only adding to the raw underground vibe of the piece. I'm assuming it's a female, but her breasts are comprised of a machine gun and a pneumatic drill, and she looks like a melting android, so who can really tell? Finally, there's this assortment of crazy characters approaching from the distance, one with a chainsaw, others with an hypodermic needles and shovel. It's a crazily energetic piece of original art from Kevin O'Neill, and you can certainly see some of this wild aesthetic in later League of Extraordinary Gentlemen works outside of the initial Victorian era settings that Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill started with. Regardless, it's a really great piece which sold as recently as 2021, but its current owner is considering offers starting at $75,000 and up, which probably exceeds martial law's annual salary. Anyway, that's it for this first episode of Original Artifacts. I hope you enjoyed seeing the original art as much as I did and my rambling wasn't too obtrusive. As always, I'd love to hear your comments and even suggestions on other artists you'd like to see. But next up, I'll have another pair of Alan Moore collaborators and feel free to try to guess which ones. Till then, drop a like on this video and also help me reach the magic number of 500 subscribers by subbing if you will, and feel free to join the always thriving Facebook group. Thanks for listening. See you next time on God Loves Comics. Bye. No Novocaine, it dulls the senses. <laughs> this is gonna hurt you more than it is me. Oh goody goody, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, don't stop now! Well, I made a lot of holes and now I gotta fill it up with this here silver stuff. Well, aren't you gonna pull any? Well, uh... Oh, go on. <laughs>